Hey everyone, welcome to Sum Zero. Today we have Bilkar Sivia, uh, who's a CFA and uh, founder of White Falcon Capital. Um, he has over 15 years of experience in investment management, um, uh, and I think I think um, is is uh, very well equipped to to talk to us about about value investing. Um, his firm um, focuses on kind of long-term compounders um, with a value orientation. Uh, totally unconstrained in terms of what he can invest in, um, but but again with, with with sort of that value investing framework behind it. Before founding White Falcon, he was with Burgundy Asset Management for eight years as a VP and investment analyst. Um, he managed an internal portfolio at Burgundy, which beat its benchmark. Uh, and before that, he was an investment analyst with Tim McIlvain at McIlvain Investment Management. Um, and he has an electrical engineering degree from the University of British Columbia and is also a CFA charter holder. Um, and he also attended the investment management workshop at Harvard Business School. So um, just one, I think, interesting point on White Falcon that, that I think is fascinating is that it's a fund with zero management fee, which you don't typically see. Obviously, most funds have, have uh, you know, management fees that range anywhere from uh, 1% to 2%, sometimes higher. Um, but but he solely relies on on a performance fee, uh, which I think is great in terms of aligning um, the fund's performance with with uh, kind of his his personal compensation. So um, with that, uh, Belkar, uh, it's great to have you on Sum Zero. Thanks for having um, me. Would love to. You. Yeah, we're going to talk about a couple of stocks today that are in your portfolio, um, which I think will help. Uh, just give insight in terms of how you think about investing. But uh, before we get into that, um, tell us a little bit about your own investing philosophy and, and how you started White Falcon. I know you launched it pretty recently in 2021, uh, but if you can give us a quick overview, that would be a great start. Sure. No, thanks. Uh, so White Falcon is essentially, uh, you know, was started to, for me to express my investment philosophy, which had kind of evolved over the years. Um, I had worked at, you know, shops that, practiced value investing. Um, and I learned a lot at the at the various uh, firms that I worked at. But over time, I kind of evolved to say, you know, kind of went back to Buffett uh, and, and determined that a portfolio should have kind of differentiated return streams. So, you know, for example, a value investor would have, you know, four bad years and then one very good year, right? And a growth investor would have four very good years and then one bad year. I mean, that's just how returns come in those two different uh, two different baskets. Uh, why why can you not kind of combine those factors and build a portfolio, you know, that has a bit of both, um, and 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 where returns could be uncorrelated, and where you can shift the portfolio one way or the other depending on the opportunities that you have at hand. Um, so that was that was kind of the kind of the founding philosophy behind White Falcon. So we divide the portfolio between compounders, you know, value today, which would be kind of your, um, you know, value, deep value companies, and then value tomorrow, you know, which would be kind of your typical growth companies where, you know, they may not be cheap today, but, but, but you can um, kind of build a scenario where they would be very, very cheap in two or three years with the growth they can have in revenues or margins. So, that's how I build a portfolio. You know, the, the relative weights of these various buckets depend on, again, the opportunity at hand. You know, when I started off, it was a lot more value, but, you know, last year growth took a big, big hit. Then the portfolio kind of tilted towards, uh, you know, towards that. Um, and, you know, I- That's think- really uh, you know, such an interesting reflection on on the way growth and value returns work. I, I think that's, it's so funny because obviously last year in 2022, anyone who is a growth investor got absolutely slammed <laughs> by uh, in- interest rate move- moves in the market. You know, kind of the, the 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 sort of impact to Nasdaq, especially, was was pretty brutal and um, and swift to say the least. Uh, and, and at the same time, I think a lot of folks were tilting their portfolios towards the more old line almost utility like businesses, um, the higher dividend yielding names and all that. So I, it's interesting to think of the, of, of the return profile of the two different types. So would you say in your portfolio, you you have, um, you know, at times um, more of a weighting towards growth names versus value names? Or you just have a healthy mix of both at the same time. Um, how do yeah. you typically... That's that's how it typically works. Again, you know, when 
So right, currently it's more growth weighted than value weighted. Again, because growth hasn't done well, value has done well. So again, right. give, so constructing the portfolio like this give you, gives you an opportunity to take money off of the value names that have done well and put them in growth names that have not done well, right? And in two years, if these growth names work um, and value is struggling, then I'd probably sell the growth names and put more in value. I think one of the things that, I mean, I anchor kind of everything on is valuation. I'm a slave to valuation. So it's, I, uh, you know, any, any decision that's made is based on the fact if, you know, the way I underwrite is, well, the, can this stock double in three years, right? And then I'd make some mistakes and then, you know, whatever the net number is, what kind of determine the returns that I would produce. Uh, and if that IRR can be obtained by a growth name, fine. By a value name, fine. Again, Personally, the the investment world is kind of divided between these two buckets. And I think the reason is because that's how allocators put them in boxes. You know, you can you can allocate to a large cap growth or a small cap value, et cetera. Um, I think these boxes, you know, you know, somebody said this, these boxes are where returns go to die, right? So it's it's a, so I'm trying to get out of the box and say, mm -hmm. I'm gonna if as long as I can under, understand the company. As long as, it, from a risk perspective, I'm not taking undue risks from an you know operating perspective or a financial leverage perspective, and I'm getting the IRR that I think you know that I I underwrite at, I buy right. That's essentially the the philosophy. And again, I just because I can understand SaaS doesn't mean I can't understand commodities. So right, I have I can I mean. There's no reason I can't understand both, and and I do understand both. So I have both. So I I actually have currently a kind of a barbelled portfolio, which is kind of commodities on one side and technology on the other. Interesting. So one I think interesting difference between growth and value investors is that uh, you know growth investors tend to be, uh, let's say, more tolerant of higher multiples than value investors. Do do you find it difficult to switch between kind of the higher multiple world and the low multiple value world, um, or is it more you're finding growth opportunities at lower multiples and therefore you're buying those because yeah, they happen to be cheap right now? It's the latter. So again, you know, valuation yeah. is very, very important because again, if you don't have valuation, you know, what we saw in growth stocks last year, without valuation, without cash flows, it's super difficult to anchor anything and the stock price can fall yeah. anywhere, right? So. So you have to have an anchor. You have to have a path to profitability. You have to have, you have to see kind of free cash flows coming in. Um, so all of that plays a part. So I essentially kind of want to see the company significantly cheapen in three to four years. You know, in three to four years, I want that company to be something that value investors would want to buy. Uh, that's kind of how I think about the growth names that I have. Yeah. And and I guess one question for you um, on on a separate note is uh, how did you come to uh, set up or structure your fund um, to not have a management fee and and solely rely on a performance fee? I think it's pretty unusual. So I'm curious how you arrived at that structure. Yeah, well, I you know I started in this business kind of reading Buffett and Munger, and you know they were always kind of my heroes. And then you know you go into the investment world, which is you know very different, you know, and you know other things come up and. Um, I wanted to kind of go back to the roots of kind of why I, again, I'm an engineer, but I kind of chose to be in an, in the in the investment industry uh, because I I had a passion for it, and the reason I had a pa and 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 Warren and Charlie kind of ignited the passion. Uh, so I just wanted to go back to the roots. You know, Warren ran his partnership with a zero management fee structure, so I just kind of copied what he did. Um, you know, essentially, so he had a zero. Uh, person management fee, six per six percent hurdle, and then a twenty five percent incentive fee. Uh, but not many people know this. But before he kind of consolidated into this structure, he also has a structure where he would have a zero percent management fee, a zero percent hurdle, and he would take one sixth of the profits. So I, ah. so I kind of just essentially copied this last uh, structure because again, from an admin perspective, it's it's a bit easier. Because you know the hurdles, you know some people have it cumulative, some people don't have it cumulative. Um, so with me, it's a zero zero fifteen structure. Um, 
I, you know, I, I think it's fair. This is kind of what I would want if I was allocating capital to somebody else. Um, so, so yeah, so I just think it's fair. That's, that's, that's why I chose it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's refreshing, and I I didn't know about that partnership fee structure that he had. That's really interesting. Um, so let's uh, you know, kind of look at um a name that you had written about on Sum Zero uh, a while ago called EPAM, IT service provider. Um, uh, I, I think it's a mid cap from a market cap standpoint. But can you give us um kind of the high level, and then we can dig in a little deeper on it? Sure. So EPAM is an IT services company, and and and. Uh, it's it's well it's listed in the U.S. Uh, it has its headquarters in the U.S., but a lot of its employees are based in in Ukraine, Russia, and Belarus. So when the war started, uh, EPAM sold off, right? Uh, and before the war, EPAM had uh, EPAM went up ten times in ten years. It was a compounder, right? Uh, and during the war, it you know it sold off, and you know for me it was kind of very similar to kind of, you know, you know, buying BP uh, when kind of the Gulf of Mexico disaster happened or Chipotle when kind of the food safety issues happened. It's, right, right. You know, it's a good company. It's a compounder, but it's kind of at, a, you know, at crossroads where people think, investors think that it can survive. Um, I've invested in IT services companies before. It was kind of squarely in my circle of competence. Um, you know, we knew after COVID, uh, many people thought IT services, you know, wouldn't survive or how would people kind of do consulting work, you know, when you can't visit uh, travel or visit offices, but, you know, Accenture and kind of EPAM and all of these companies just prospered, right? Because these companies are essentially a toll road on technology spend. You know, any company that wants to figure out how to spend on technology, you, you have to hire an Accenture or an EPAM to help you implement it. Um, and I also knew that, you know, with these companies, the employees can work from home. Uh, they don't have to go to an office and the employees can relocate. Uh, and the other thing that kind of gave uh, me some confidence was, uh, e you know, kind of just going back into the history of the kind of Russia-Ukraine conflict, in 2014, uh, there were also some, uh, you know, skirmishes and, you know, there were kind of disturbances. So EPAM had started diversifying its delivery base uh, in 2014. So it had kind of delivery centers in India, delivery centers in Mexico, uh, and all it needed to do was kind of really um, kind of expand those to kind of make up for any deficits that Russia or Ukraine would produce. Uh, it also had a billion five in cash, so it could buy delivery centers. It could kind of essentially buy employees temporarily. Uh, and when you say delivery centers, you mean just locations where they had programmers or that's right. That's technical right. folks. Yeah. So I'm curious. Did you, it was I think you posted the idea last summer on some zero, but you were familiar with the business um, from your engineering days, or what was your initial sort of contact with the company? Yeah. So from? I so so again, I mean, at, at Burgundy, the firm that I used to work at, you know, we essentially did deep dives on. So this was so, so Burgundy was essentially a research first organization where you kind of really went deep into whatever you were looking at. So I had looked at the IT services industry, you know, at one point kind of done months and months of work on it, met all the companies, you know, kind of followed them for many quarters. Yeah. So I kind of knew the players, kind of knew how they work, knew how margins kind of come about, knew kind of what reputation, you know, what player has, et cetera. So again, it was, it was, it was something that was in my circle of competence, you know, when it came up, I, but I knew the business. I knew the industry, um, and 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 it was yeah. You knew it was a good. You thought of it as a good business, but but it wasn't attractively priced until the Ukraine war. That's right. That's right. So it was right. even even during the depths of COVID, it was at thirty five times earnings. So you know it was, and it would trade at fifty times earnings. You know normally, which was you know which would be too high of a multiple for for me to pay. Um, but but anyway, so I I kind of did scenario analysis and said, okay, you know if they lose, you know, ten percent of the employees, then the earnings would be X. If they lose twenty percent of the employees, earnings would be Y. And kind of, how soon can they gain these employees, you know, in India or 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 Mexico? And then what would earnings power be in three years? Right. That was kind of my, you know, my analysis. And 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 I figured that at the price that it was trading at, uh, it was discounting even worse. Right. 
Uh, so, you know, we initiated a position, uh, you know, I, I, I wrote about the idea on sum zero uh, as, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to management, uh, you know, as I got more clarity, I sized up my position. Uh, again, you know, value investors mostly average down, don't average up, but I kind of do both. Uh, so I averaged up on this position and, uh, and it, uh, and it did well. So interesting. What was the, uh, let's say one year forward multiple when you first uh, started buying? Yeah. So again, the, it was, so the one year forward is very, was at, at that time was very, very difficult because you didn't know how much disruption their delivery centers would face against the, the ones that were in, you know, in the Ukraine. So I did I did some scenario analysis and figured that the stock is about between twenty and thirty time forward earnings. Uh, so again, depending upon how much damage the war had done, essentially, yeah. And 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 um, like, what was the like historical growth rate? Twenty before 25, the war. 30 percent uh, yes. growth in revenues. They would produce a lot of cash flow. They would take the cash flow and do M and A, which would kind of kind of add capabilities or clients, uh, and then kind of grow with that. So M and A added about two to five percent of growth every year. Yeah. You know, one of the things that bef just before the war, EPAM was at a point where it was inflecting on margins. So again, you know, EPAM was making about 12, 13 percent margins. Um, you know, as you know, other companies kind of depending on the company make make higher. Uh, they were at a point where, and you know, scale uh, helps you in this business make higher margins. You know, the the bigger the projects that you have, you know, the more margin you can kind of derive from those uh, from those uh, uh, clients. Uh, and EPM was at that point where it was, you know, kind of inflecting was going to inflect on margins. Uh, yeah, and that's also why it was very expensive, kind of before the war. Uh, and and again, they you know they've they've executed really, really well through the war. They, you, know, they, you know, they helped re kind of relocate their employees in the Ukraine. They kind of uh, put up a hundred million dollar fund to kind of help people. Um, you know, they stepped up hiring and kind of, you know, relocated employees into kind of Poland and other neighboring, uh, neighboring countries. So their earnings power actually did not kind of go down as much. So they, uh, they will produce uh, uh, about $10 in earnings per share this year. Right, which mm -hmm. you know, again, you know, uh, you know, we rolled up the stock at two hundred a share, which would make it twenty times earnings. Uh, right now, it's trading at about 30, 32 times earnings, uh, which is again not cheap. But if it inflects on margins and it and it grows earnings kind of 15, 20 percent, uh, there's no reason why you know this can just kind of grow at its uh, EPS growth rate. Yeah. Um, and what what are the multiples of competitors look like now? So yeah, so 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 Accenture. Um, so I mean, so you have the Indian players, so like Infosys, you know, Tata, uh, you know, and, and others, uh, and then you have Accenture. Uh, one of the things that I think it is important to highlight is a lot of the legacy players, such, such as Accenture, uh, Cognizant, Infosys, TCS. You know, they essentially had two businesses. Um, one was a legacy business, you know, which was kind of um, kind of deploying, e you know, ERPs or kind of kind of maintaining, you know, systems that were very very old. Just kind of, and 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 then you have the digital transformation business, which is helping helping these uh, clients on the front end of their business, not just on the back end of things. And what was happening was the clients were asking IT services players to reduce. Uh, costs reduce pricing on the legacy business so that they could invest more on the digital side of the business. So if the digital only players had higher growth, higher multiples, and the legacy players had kind of lower growth, lower multiple, EPAM was a, kind of a high growth, high multiple player. So, you know, EPAM's peer is not an emphasis. EPAM's peer is somebody like a Dava in Dava uh, or a or a Globent uh, companies like that, and these companies are and were trading at higher multiples, uh, so 20, 30, 40 times earnings. Um, I'm curious. You had mentioned talking to management. What, what sort of channel checks do you typically do when you uh, research a name? Yeah. So I, 
So I um, uh, subscribe to um, kind of an expert network library, which I kind of consult, uh, you know, which is which is very helpful. Uh, talking to management, talking to competitors, uh, you know, that's 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 kind of that's kind of what I typically do. Yeah. yeah. So I invest. Um, yeah, and that and you know, I've 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 found that to be uh, that to be helpful, uh, kind of yeah. in, in building a a full picture. And what would you say are kind of risk to the thesis now, just given that obviously the stock's gone up a lot since you first yeah. posted about it? So, so now the the risk is kind of slowing IT spend. Um, you know, I think the the delivery risk is now not a risk because they have diversified their, their delivery base. That's not a problem. They didn't really lose clients. Um, you know, that was that was not an issue, you know, for them. Um, you know, the risk is that they grow slower than what, you know, I think or the market thinks that that the EPS doesn't compound at 15 to 20%, maybe it compounds at 10 to 15 or something like that. Um, other than that, I really don't see, um, you know, a big risk. Um, you know, they, they, I mean, again, you know, the reason that they went up 10 times in 10 years uh, before the war is because, you know, these are, you know, these IT services business are execution intensive businesses, right? I mean, the mode is that you can deliver better, faster, cheaper than your competitor on time, and you build a reputation doing that. Uh, and that requires kind of constant managerial effort. Uh, and, you know, this is run by, it, you know, it's still run by its founder, um, you know, who has kind of a large dollar stake in the business uh, and they manage it really, really well. So until, you know, this management is in place, um, I'm, I'm not too worried about, um, uh, you know, the business kind of, um, kind of going off the rails. Yeah, really interesting. So, um, good segue to uh, to to diversity, which is another stock that you own. Yeah. Um, I guess unlike EPAM, that so this is a sanitation business. Um, so I'm assuming lower multiple. Um, obviously not as uh, tech oriented, but uh, sort of I think highlights the other side of your investing mandate or your investing style um so can you talk a little bit, a bit about that it's a, i think a more recent um position as well yes yes sure no it's it, it's a very interesting company uh so so diversity is essentially a chemicals company it's it's a distributor of sanitation chemicals so any um uh you know hotels uh factories you know uh, distilleries uh hospitals you know all of them need cleaning supplies and they have to be cleaned uh, they need sanitation. Uh, some of them, such as kind of food and beverage producers, uh, you know, have to have cycles of kind of cleaning their equipment uh, from a regulatory perspective. Uh, so all so what 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 this company does is actually provides them chemicals that they need for their spe specific task, uh, and then it's responsible for replenishing those chemicals uh, and and kind of giving training to the employees of of the company in in in, in how to use the chemicals. So that's essentially the business. Uh, it's it's it, you know it, you know it's really interesting. The company has an interesting history in the sense that it, it it's had many owners. So it was you know originally owned by Molson, uh, and then it was sold from Molson to Unilever, uh, and then at some point uh, S.C. Johnson bought it, uh, and then uh, a private equity company came in and kind of bought a part stake from S.C. Johnson, uh, and then Sealed Air bought it from both of them. Uh, and then sealed and then Bain Capital bought it from Sealed Air. So it's kind of gone through many, many owners over the years, you know, because of which, you know, it kind of lost its way, lost market share. Its main competitor is Ecolab, right? And Ecolab, uh, you know, if you know, has been a compounder in the US, you know, has done really, really well for its shareholders. Uh, and Ecolab kind of took advantage of kind of, kind of diversity's distraction and took market share in the US, which is kind of the best market. Uh, for for sanitation because here from a regulatory perspective uh, you know you know you know they really care about sanitation so yeah and where where is uh so where is diversity based what where where do they have kind of the the most penetration yeah. so it's it's based in the u.s so it's so it's listed in the u.s uh but it, but it's 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 a very heavy 
Europe and emerging markets business. So because it was owned by Unilever for many, many years and Unilever kind of used it to kind of push its um, kind of cleaning chemicals, right, into its market. So for example, in the UK, uh, diversity would be bigger than Ecolab. In India, it would be bigger than Ecolab. These are kind of traditional, strong Unilever markets. Uh, so Europe and emerging markets are kind of 75% of sale for diversity. And then US is about 25. Um, so it's more of an international business than it is a US business. Again, but it's listed in the US, right? So what happened here is uh, Bain IPO'd the company last year. Uh, it had about 15% of the down margins and, and, and they kind of IPO'd and kind of sold the IPO saying the margins will slowly go to 20%. Right. Uh, but what happened in the interim is that margins actually came down to about 11.6%. Right. And, and the reason being that kind of, you know, the raw materials into cleaning chemicals are natural gas based, food based. And because of kind of supply chain issues, kind of raw material price escalations, et cetera, uh, uh, their margins came down in a big, big, big way. So all those investors kind of bailed on the stock. Right. Uh, and uh, kind of disappointing after disappointing earnings report, you know, meant that people just weren't weren't interested. So kind of that's 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 where we came in. Kind of we saw the stock at about four forty a share. Uh, had IPO at fourteen dollars a share. Uh, wow. This, yeah, yeah. I mean, it. I mean, it. It it got really. I mean, one of the things that I learned over over my career, kind of my my ex boss Tim McElvain, uh, you know, he's a deep value investor, and he buys only from forced sellers, right? So mm -hmm. I have something that I kind of want to keep in mind. I mean, is there a forced seller on the other side that's selling for reasons except price? You know, and in this case, you know, that will, you know, again, talking to management, talking to kind of doing my challenge checks, you know, you determine that people are worried that, you know, Europe will have a recession, that the US dollar will just keep getting stronger, um, that, you know, there wasn't enough liquidity in the stock, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So people were, just kind of, they knew it was cheap, but they weren't buying it because they didn't want to kind of buy ahead of all these negative catalysts, you know. Uh, I looked at the stock, determined uh, that, you know, the business that it isn't, that it has disappointed, it has hair, uh, but at this point, it's discounting the worst, right? The US dollar, that was a big headwind for it because again, it, it reports in US dollars, although it earns in euros and, and, and rupees and, you know, so when you report in US dollars, you know, even though you grow in local currency, you know, there is no growth in US dollars, right? Because the US dollar was so strong. Uh, and then you had all these raw material uh, pressure. So I kind of saw the US dollar weakening, uh, crude ebbing, um, you know, you know, the debt was termed out. Uh, so, you know, and they were doing things, kind of structural things on the supply chain side of things, such as consolidating uh, their 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 network, uh, which which would mean that margins would inflate and go up from here. Uh, so that's kind of my thesis that that margins have bottom, they would kind of go up from here. Uh, and because of the operating and financial leverage, I think I think the stock can kind of two or three times from kind of when I posted the idea. So when when you when you first looked at it, I mean, what was the what was the valuation like on like a more normalized basis? I mean, versus your estimates of where earnings were going to go. So, so again, you know, one of the things that that kind of gives you confidence in the business. I mean, so again, I mean, to your previous question on, um, you know, I hadn't look, I hadn't looked at cleaning chemicals before. I knew of of Ecolab, but I had looked, but I had looked at CPG companies before, kind of consumer product companies. I kind of know that industry quite well. Um, and I knew from that industry, you know, the role that diversity plays, the kind of the distribution uh, plays uh, in in kind of the uh, kind of kind of helping diversity have have a moat. Um, so that kind of anchored by from a risk perspective. Uh, but on the on the multiples perspective, uh, it was so it, so it was so when I bought it, it was trading at ten times depressed this year's earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, uh, EBITDA. And and about seven times kind of three year forward uh, normalized EBITDA, right? Uh, and then it would produce some cash that could help it kind of deleverage the balance sheet, 
So you kind of take that into account and you know you kind of calculate what um, you know, you kind of put a multiple in three years and say, you know, if if this is the multiple, the pay down some that kind of you know where the equity can be. Um uh, it was about kind of three times where the you know where you know where the stock was. How levered is it today? So it is levered. So that's that's one of the risks with the you know with the thesis, you know, partly because of that, this will always be kind of a smaller position for me. Um, so uh, so it it so again, be, so the leverage hasn't gone up, but because EBITDA de declined so much, debt to EBITDA went up to about five times. They want to kind of have kind of three and a half times ratio, and that will happen not just with debt pay down, but that will happen as kind of EBITDA inflex and and and, and go up. But again, you know, I I have a mentor in the business that talks about good debt and bad debt, right? Um, you know, and and good debt being kind of fixed debt that's termed out. Um, you know, which if it's it's at rates that are below today, essentially kind of is 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 good debt. Um, you know, that's kind of how I see diversity's debt. They don't there are no near near term maturities. Uh, there's no reason for them to kind of raise equity, even if uh, you know, this kind of falls on hard time. Um, so, so from my perspective, it's a risk, uh, but not uh, kind of a deadly risk. Given that it's a small cap, um, what what's the current sell side coverage on the name? And I'm just curious, what what, it, what is like what's the consensus view on the name? Where do you feel like you're thinking about it in a in a different way? Yeah, no, people cover it. Uh, people cover it, and 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 the consensus view is that it's you know the average target price is I think six dollars or six dollars and fifty cents or whatever. I mean that's what it was when it, when I bought it at four forty, um, and and the view is that you know things are fine, but there are short term risks. So it's from my perspective, it, it kind of becomes a time arbitrage, uh, mm. right? Um, that that you know yes you know maybe the next quarter is not going to be ideal right and it may not be ideal right but i'm not managing for the next quarter uh, and and i'm managing for the next three years um and and i will add if if it um it, you know if it doesn't you know one of the other things that i think it's important to mention is you know one of the other things that i kind of incorporate in my in my analysis is uh technicals again very very simple technical then i'm i'm kind of a 95 percent fundamentals guy but you know sometimes you just look at a stock and it's kind of bounced bounces along the same line right it, it just at you know at a certain level it just finds buyers uh and for this this specific stock i saw it bounce off of that four dollar level three times um and that kind of gave me some confidence that you know whatever uh you know the short term is discounted into into the stock price uh, right now. You have any sense of who those buyers are? I I think it's just a long time long term buyers that kind of hold the stock. That I mean, there are a lot of kind of again short term capital that has sold, uh, and a lot of kind of short term capital that wouldn't buy right now. Uh, but there are uh, I mean, for example, MFS Investments kind of you know they're a value firm. Uh, have a stake and you know they've been buying so kind of these long-term investors uh, have you know kind of put a bit in and kind of buy when the stock goes. yeah you you think that uh this would also fall into the category of a longer term compounder that you could potentially own for three to five years maybe longer so so again you know it, this company has the potential to behave like ecolab right so 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 ecolab again did really well because again this is something you know, this is a recurring revenue business. This is a necessary business. Uh, companies kind of need sanitation products. Um, you know, you can grow by tucking M&A. Uh, you can kind of uh, increase your margins by offering other services such as water uh, treatment, things like that, which diversity is increasingly doing, which Ecolab has done for many years. So they have a lot of potential to do a lot of things. So my thesis, my thinking right now is, you know, I, I you know, I'll, I'll hold it and I'll wait for the margins to go up. I'll, I'll inflect, and at that point, I'll determine if I want to hold it for longer. If the management is doing the right things for the long term, uh, and if this thing become uh, become a compound. Um, one thing on the moat itself it, is the moat uh, the product at all, or is it is it really more a distribution the brand? 
it's customer relations. It's sorry, it, it's distribution density, right? It's it's distribution density and then customer relationship. So again, when you you know you you know you have a chemicals business, you have clients, you have to service them every week, every two weeks. Um, you have to train these clients. You kind of put up equipment at the client side, so it's your equipment that you put up that you then fill with your chemicals, right? Um, and and then these chemicals are typically uh, very concentrated, right? And 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 then you have to give training to the clients, uh, training employees on how to dilute this chemical to uh, to clean. And then the, the chemical itself is formulated for specific things. So for example, uh, you know, uh, kind of a beef, uh, you know, factory would have kind of a high fat content that kind of sticks to the surface, and then kind of a different type of chemical would be needed for that versus a brewery. Mm -hmm. So, so they do have to formulate and supply this on a regular basis, uh, on a cost-effective basis for them. So it kind of becomes so it's, you know, if you want to think what kind of mental business model, this is more of a distributor than anything else. It's kind of a value-added distributor, right? It, it, you know, it, it, it kind of buys from. Yes. It kind of value adds a little bit, and then it sells to kind of multiple, multiple, multiple clients, and it has to service its clients frequently. Um, and 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 clients have high switching costs to to changing because they have to kind of get new training, they have to stop kind of their production, etc. So unless you don't kind of piss off the client, it's very rare that you lose a contract. You know that's why yeah. it's very difficult for diversity to gain market share in the U.S., which is a very strong ecolab uh, 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 market. Just to uh, to kind of wrap things up, um, obviously, uh, so much of what's driving the market right now is is the Fed and um, macro concerns. Uh, you know, you, you kind of hear it at, after every earnings call or during every earnings call, CEOs talking about kind of um, outlook, and it's it's more often than not 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 so pretty. And and I, I'm just curious, has anything going on? Um, in the macro environment affected just how you underwrite positions or, or just kind of what your own hurdle is before you, you know, decide to invest in a name. You've talked about leverage, uh, but I'm just curious kind of if anything's changed philosophically in terms of how you're looking at what to invest in. So, you know, nothing has changed. I mean, again, I remain very anchored to valuations. If I find something that is trading cheap, is trading, you know, has been sold by kind of four sellers, uh, you know, I I would look at that if I understand it. I would buy it, uh, kind of no matter what is happening on on kind of the Fed side. Uh, you know, having said that, um, you know, I kind of I can't forecast macro. I mean, macro is not something I do, but you know, you do have to understand that you know fundamentals are 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 important. Uh, but fundamentals are important in the long term, right? In the short term, there are things like sentiment, flows. Uh, you know, that can be very, very important. So I kind of watch for those things just to see if I should add the margin, you know, raise some cash, uh, you know, if, you know, things are getting kind of overbought, you know, just, just like it was kind of two or three weeks ago, um, you know, I I raised some cash, right? Because it was kind of, you know, a bit too, uh, you know, too, you know, too fast, too soon. Um, and, you know, when in October last year, I was fully invested in, June last year, I was fully invested again because, you know, sentiment was very, very uh, bearish. Uh, yeah, cash levels are very high, so I so I kind of watch those things. And again, if if I if I'm finding things that I can buy uh, very very cheaply, then I I invest. And again, my diversification comes from the fact that again, as I said, I have a barbell kind of commodities um, kind of technology. Uh, portfolio. So, for example, if the Fed is doing something and technology stocks are doing really bad, and but you know, for example, I'm you know tech resources. You know, no matter what the Fed does, you know, you need more copper, right? You need more more of these commodities, right? So I would kind of take some kind of capital from there and kind of put it in the put it in the growth bucket, right? Uh, again, very difficult to predict any of this. I mean, anybody asks me, you know, this question. My answer usually is, you know, it's super uncertain, and that I don't know. Uh, but then, you know, as 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 Talib said, you know, don't ask somebody what they think. Ask what's in the portfolio, uh, and what the portfolio is, you know, tech and commodities. So, 
Um, speaking of tech, and we can end on this. Uh, I mean, last year, I think Meta was down 70%. Google and Amazon both crushed. Uh, I mean, it's been a bloodbath. Um, uh, I, you know, at least at a high level, I, I think they would fall under the GARP category. Yeah. Maybe last year they may, you could argue Meta um, should have been true value play. Did, did any of them hit your screen? Or I'm just curious if you had looked at any of the big tech names. Well, I, I should have listened to you on, uh, on Meta. So you know, my, my, my mistake there, not, not buying Meta. Uh, I, still cheap, I, man. <laughs> yeah, no, it's still not expensive, right? And uh, so, uh, so I didn't end up doing, you know, one of the things that sometimes, you know, I, when I own the large caps, uh, and, you know, and I'm a small emerging manager, I almost feel bad on large caps, even though you shouldn't, because, you know, they've actually done, some of them have done better and have had more inefficiencies than some of the small caps, right? I mean, people ask, you know, what edge do you have in large caps? But if you look at these moves, um, you know, the, the obvious edge is kind of psychological edge, right? Um, but, but, but anyway. Well, there's so many, but there's just so much... Um quantitative like algorithmic trading on the larger cap names and a lot of that is purely momentum driven so you get yeah as you're saying you get these massive moves look at tesla's another great example just crazy crazy moves um in companies with you know 500 billion dollar market caps um and and it's, it's in a way i almost feel like the liquidity hurts them <laughs> because everyone's in the name so i don't know it's it, yeah, it was pretty fascinating to watch um, because in your you know in your head you would think okay well you know the smaller cap tech names uh, should be down more than than the big tech names uh, for you know for many reasons um, but you sort of almost it almost seemed like there was no dispersion in terms of the drawdowns between the small tech you know mid cap tech and big tech. That's right. They're just all down kind of equally and it didn't really make sense. That's right. So, you know, I do, I do own Amazon. Um, kind of on the large side, I own uh, uh, AMD. Uh, again, I, mm. kind of, I see them both as compounders uh, that are trading at very reasonable multiples right now. Uh, again, you know, Amazon is a very controversial kind of large cap stock. So I kind of leave that, leave that on the side. But kind of AMD, again, you know, people are kind of worried about the short term uh kind of semiconductor cycle which kind of is you know is you know is fair uh but again at a certain point you know you know i you know i bought the stock at about 62 dollars a share when the sentiment on these stocks was very very negative uh you know you had oversold conditions on kind of the semiconductor index uh and you know yes you can have you know short term you can have volatility but i see amd as, as kind of a secular grower uh, that is taking share from its competitors that has kind of tailwinds from AI and, and, and other things due to which it can grow for a long, long time. And again, this is this is a kind of a capital light play on all these themes. Uh, and it kind of produces a lot of, kind of free cash flow that, that can anchor its valuations, right? So um, so you know, I have that. I kind of on the mid-cap side. Um, or on the small cap side, I guess I, I own platforms like Rover. Uh, Rover is kind of a pet um, uh, pet marketplace where kind of pet owners and kind of kind of pet sitters um, find each other to you know helping people to kind of set their pets while they're traveling or kind of dog walking or things like that. Uh, again, it's a marketplace yeah. that's that's you know that's currently making uh, about ten percent margins. There's no reason. Uh, why they can't, you know, the, the management's target is 30%. Um, and there's no reason why they can't go there. Uh, uh, and again, I mean, this is a growth stock that I think created, created as a value stock. Uh, so yeah. That's a company that I own. We, can, uh, we can save that one for another conversation. <laughs> um, Bokar, this is super, super interesting. Uh, it sounds like you do quite a lot of homework on on all these names. And it's, it's cool to see how you've kind of leveraged all the research you did um, from your prior fund um to find new kind of uh just just new names that that uh um that you can get up to speed on quickly and understand the business model and also cool to see how you've kind of got uh flexibility in your own kind of valuation framework which is which is which is nice to see um but um bill Carr, thanks again we'll, we'll certainly be in touch on on some of these names i'll be i'll be tracking them myself um 
And uh, we're looking forward to uh, chatting again. No, oh, thank you. This was just a lot of fun. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate it. Thanks, Malkar. Yeah, take care. Bye.